before I hop into a massive talk on biomarkers, you need to know what biomarkers actually are. And essentially, they're anything which can be detected or measured in the body. So this could be in the blood, CSF, or tissue, but it can actually be other instruments. So for example, EEG is an example of a biomarker. So is the ECG, which measures the heart. Now, what it's useful for is to detect diseases. But you also need to understand what normal is. So a lot of biomarker work is about looking at changes which happen in disease versus the control population. This is important to understand. But depending on the control population you pick up, your ranges might differ. So for every part of the world, you need to redo this assessment. <coughs> now, if we quickly move into the spinal fluid, the CSF is probably the best place to assess what's happening in the brain. Um, we can't do brain biopsies. That's not a feasible option in practice these days. And often we're looking at that in a post-mortem perspective. So you don't understand what's happening at the beginning of the disease if you start looking at post-mortem cases. Um, but CSF, by essence of proximity, is very easy to measure. And uh, as you can see, you've got a couple of proteins sitting outside in the spinal fluid which indicate what's happening in the brain. Now, there's a simple fact, which is that everything which you see, or majority of the proteins which you see in the spinal fluid are actually derived from the blood because they form in a region of the brain in the ventricles called the choroid plexus, which just filters the blood and shoves everything into the spinal fluid. This is because that's how the brain derives its nutrients. But 20% of the brain proteins do in fact make it into the CSF. So that's a good place to measure. Now, out of interest, does anyone here in the audience know how much spinal fluid there is at any one point? How much do you think? 500 mils? High or low? Low? Yeah? Yeah, definitely. It's much lower. So there's not a lot if you think about the size of the brain and the spinal cord. So what we're looking at is at any one stage, there's 150 mils of spinal fluid or 160 mil, depending on how tall you are in your body. Now, this is not to say that if a clinician comes along and decides to take 10 mils, oh my God, I've lost a fraction of this, what am I gonna do? Um, you don't have to worry about that because the spinal fluid <coughs> recollects or reforms four times a day. So in total, you've got about 600 mils going through your body. So don't worry about doing lumbar punctures. So if we look at what's happening in that 150 mils, things get drained into the blood and then they get metabolized and they work their way into the kidneys and out as urine. Now, at every stage there's a difference. And this is important to understand when you're looking at biomarkers or things you want to measure in the various compartments. So the 150 mils actually dilutes itself in the five liters of cardiac output which you have. That's your vascular circulation pool. So anything which is in minute quantities will get diluted out. And the heart is pumping at about 60 beats per minute. So that one little five ml blood test may not pick up. And this is why microbiological research is hard because infections are whooshing around and you may not pick up the bugs you want and it takes ages to diagnose it. Once you get into the urine, things are metabolized. So what started off in the brain as a fully formed antibody is broken down into what we call light chains by the time it gets out into the urine. So things are very different in the urine. So you need to understand the different compartments which you look at for each biomarker to know what you're measuring. So that's some basic science, but what do we have in terms of armamentarium for MS. And the best thing which was developed, donkeys years ago, almost a century or two centuries ago, was the oligoclonal band test. Now, 
we've heard this mentioned many times already this morning, and what does it actually look like? And this is what oligoclonal bands are. So you see at the bottom panel is the normal. And what you have is the blood on top and the spinal fluid at the bottom. And the bottom panel, you see no bands, just a smear, and that's no presence of antibodies. Okay, everyone understands that? Now, if we look at the top two, they allow you to diagnose confidently that this is MS. So what you have at the top is what's called CSF positive oligoclonal band, but negative in the blood. So you will often see this C plus sign, S minus sign on the result, and that's what it means. It means that smear of antibody pattern which you see, and that's why it's also called oligo or many, many antibodies, it's not just a single antibody, is predominantly produced in the spinal fluid. Okay. Now, if you look at the one below it, you also see a slight pattern in the blood as well, and that's what we call the more than pattern. So you will see a designation C plus greater than S plus. And that also means that it's MS. Now, everyone, when I talk about oligoclonal bands, they ask, well, what's the difference between the two? I don't think it's a difference. I think it's, we're capturing a different stage of the disease. So is MS an inside out disease or is it all just coming in from the blood? So you can hypothesize about that. And at the moment, what's quite topical is the gut microbiome, whether that can be causing a problem in the brain. So a lot of people wonder if that's what we're seeing. We're capturing an early point in the disease where it will then transfer into a more predominantly CNS disease. Or it may not change at all. And some people stay in one compartment than the other. So you can see the biology of the disease is actually very different and can be different between individual patients. Um, sometimes you also see the third pattern, which is called the mirror pattern, where it's almost identical. And often this is a sign that we're not dealing with MS. We're talking about systemic infections or other autoimmune disorders such as SLE or Sjogren's syndrome or um, paraneoplastic disease. But just to give it a caveat, some MS patients may present with this initial pattern. So if a year down the line, you think, oh dear, there's new lesions coming up. Maybe we're not dealing with SLE because none of the other lupus signs are present in this patient. Or maybe we're not dealing with uh, systemic vasculitis. You may want to re-LP that patient. And if you, then their pattern changes, then they've got MS. Okay, so this is the problem with diagnosis, even at a biological level, and nothing is foolproof. But in majority of cases, the actual sensitivity of the oligoclonal band test is about greater than 95%, and the specificity is greater than 95%. Now, we've heard about MRI this morning, but just to say, this is probably the best test you have in terms of sensitivity and specificity for the disease. If we take MRI, these are likelihood ratios, so likelihood ratios are what is the likelihood that someone will have the disease if there was X number of lesions in the brain, or what is the likelihood that they don't have the disease if they don't have any lesion in the brain. And you can calculate this for MRI. And what you find is that if you have on MRI greater than 10 or 8 lesions, the likelihood of having MS is 3 or 2. Now, in terms of positive results, you have a strong chance of having a disease if your likelihood ratio is greater than 10. Okay, so the actual sensitivity of MRI is not great for the disease. Now, it is actually more specific because if you look at the likelihood of getting a negative result when you get no lesions, is about 0.1 to 0.5. So the way for negative results works is that you are unlikely to have the disease if you're less than 
point zero one to point zero five, it's moderate likelihood of not having the disease. So if you don't have any lesions, you've got moderate likelihood of not having the disease. Now that's because of the poor um, case accrual of actually knowing what these lesions are. And it, for that reason, on a biological level or on a statistical level, MRI will never compare to the 95% sensitivity and specificity which oligoclonal have. And this is also one of the reasons why people have had to accept this. And although with MRI you're diagnosing the disease earlier, you're also including people who don't have MS and therefore running into problems later on. So you've, got, you've managed now to diagnose the disease much, much earlier, but half the population, or less than that, don't have MS. So by reintroducing the oligoclonal bands, you then start cutting out that population. And that's where you then make a d disease what it is. So you need to always reintroduce the biology, and that's what they've done. Now, moving on to what I'm interested in as a clinician, which is how to prognosticate patients. And one of the things which we've looked at is how to look at how disability is accrued in MS. So if you look at this upside down tree, you've got various biomarkers and various therapeutics which you can use. In fact, you can, if you know the mode of action of your drug, you can pick a biomarker which is influenced. So this may be an immunological profile, B cells, for example. You can look at CD19, CD20 counts, or you can look at um, various T cell profiles. And that may be how the drug is working. But for us, our clinical endpoint is whether patients become disabled, and that's very easy to measure, which is the loss of axons. And uh, what has been uh, revolutionary in MS, as far as I'm concerned, is the ability to uh, measure accurately in the spinal fluid and also now in the blood of the axonal proteins which are broken down during an MS attack. And these proteins are called neurofilaments. Um, just a show of hands, how many of you have heard of neurofilaments in the room? Um, okay, so there's a lot of neurofilament novices here. So I haven't, ha I haven't got a slide exactly on it, I think. Let's have a look. Do I have an explanation slide now? Um, so what they are, the filament proteins sit in axons, and they determine the size of the axon as well as the length and also how thick the axons are. Okay? And during an inflammatory attack, you only don't just see demyelination or loss of myelin. There's also damage to the axon. And these proteins are then released into the CSF. Some of them drain back into the blood. Now, what we found during one of our massive um, clinical studies in secondary progressive MS is that neurofilaments equated with disability. So if you measure time 25 foot walk, what you have at the bottom of the graph is the seconds which patients take to complete. So it goes from zero to 240 on the bottom part of the graph and then the percentage completing the test. Now, if you have the green dotted line to the left, which is if you have absent neurofilaments, you completed the test below 30 seconds. If you have very high, above average levels of neurofilaments in red, you completed your time 25 foot walk under 150 seconds. That's a huge difference, okay? And that's what tells you that the biological readout correlates with the disability. I wasn't happy just with it sitting in the lab like this. This is a clinical trial. My interest is as a clinician. And a year and a half ago, I introduced this test into our NHS practice. And it has been one of the most helpful things which we've done. So I've got two cases just quickly to go through to explain to you how, we, how you can see its utility. So case one. 26 years old. In uh, June 2014, they presented with tingling and numbness in the legs, lasting about three months, went to see her GP, was told it was stress, and the things resolved, so she went back. Okay, the stress, she was doing a degree course, and this is probably what caused the problem. Then uh, the following year, she presents with facial numbness. Now, facial numbness is very difficult to ignore. <laughs> 
we could have forgone the tingling in the feet, but not numbness. So at that point, she was uh, referred. And clinically on examination, there was very little to find except for a few signs, and her EDSS score was low. Um, she was counseled on the first-line treatment, and this is a problem. We have two first-line options. If it, I haven't put the injectables, they could also be there, but um, most patients would like oral treatment. So the options are between something like dimethyl fumarate or teraflunamide and alemtuzumab. We're fortunate for that, but how do you decide which drug to put the patient on? Now, at this point, most clinicians say, I'd like the MRI, please, which is fine. So that's the MRI, and I have to say, I had to look very hard, and there's one lesion. If I can put the arrow on it. Okay, so that's the lesion. So not much happening there. So I think, you know, first line is good. And we did the lumbar puncture, and this was the neurofilament light chain level. So 358 picograms per mil for her age is normal. Now that's an additional confidence booster in saying, okay, I'm happy that she went on the first line le level because the, she doesn't have huge evidence of high levels of axonal damage. Okay. Now, move on to the next case, a similar patient, around the same age, in their 30s, they present to the A&E with a fit. So this is a single fit, and in A&E, the concern when you have fits in a young person is whether they have a brain tumor of some sort and they had a scan and immediately because there were several little hypodensities everybody knew this is going to be MS in a young person. So the neurology registrar went down to see them and was able to talk them into two further relapses which they had before because as you know seizures aren't a relapse event in MS okay it's not included. Um, so they had two years ago, right facial numbness, and a year ago, left arm numbness. If you think about the last case, this person is not very different to the previous case. Around the same age, two relapses a year apart. And this is where you then come into the problem on clinical examination. Hey, their EDSS score is also only 1.5. So the last person was one. Not much differentiating. How do you decide which treatment to put the person in? And practically, without having any additional tests, you would have said this patient qualifies for first-line treatment. Okay, you can't tell which one, but the MRI scan is useful. Lots more lesions compared to the other patient. But um, the Queen Square natural history data now shows that T2 lesions don't prognosticate in terms of long-term disability. So the amount of lesions, you can have many, but you may not fall into the category of those people 15 years down the line, and now they have 30 years down the line, they say that they can't tell just from T2 lesions. What can be helpful is if you knew the level of brain atrophy, which is quite substantial. Now, this is somebody in their 30s with a lot of black Space. Now, black space in MRI is very bad news. That means that you've lost a lot of cortical volume and your interventricular volumes also expanded. Now, wait for it. This is the neurofilament light chain result. Very different. So for those of you who can't see it at the back, this is 7,194. Right. Clinically, two patients who looked the same on the books. Very different biologically. The second patient, I hope you'd agree, is a higher chance of progressing to disability and wheelchair. And that's the patient you need to be able to target. And that's how we're, a biological test now changes the way we manage MS. And, um, and I'm hoping that there will be a s steep adoption as we move through any innovation and then we will always have the conservative neurologists at the top. Okay? Right. Thank you.